Sorry about that. Well, hey, everybody, welcome to our 10th session of the 2024 Library of Things collab. So excited to have y'all continue with us on this journey. We just have three of these sessions left in this cycle. And today we're going to be focusing on taking libraries of things mobile. So the various ways of, of taking them out, uh, be it a truck, kiosks, or shipping container. So we've got three presentations. We're going to, um, after we hear from each presenter, we'll have an opportunity for Q&A. And then we'll move on to the next presenter. And at the end, we'll, if we still have more time, there'll be more time for questions. Uh, as we've been doing, we'll leave the room open for another 15 minutes after the session completes uh, in case anybody has things they want to talk about, their local projects or anything else related to the collab. And this session, as all of our sessions, will be recorded and will be posted to Canvas. So we'll get the video, transcript, and uh, chat record. Uh, we'll all be up there as, as well as any of the resources that are shared during the session. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it to our first presenter, uh, Morella. Thanks, Tom. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I was having a bit of tech problems, so Candice will kindly share her screen. I'm, I'm going to be talking with you about my experience at running the Share Shed, which is a traveling library of things in England, in the southwest of England, more precisely. So we are we started out in 2017 in a small town called Totnes. So Candice, can you please next slide so you can see the a little image of a garage where we started out. And that's uh, was the town council let us free of charge for six months to pilot the idea of Library of Things in, and this is like a small town, eight and a half thousand people in rural Devon, that's the county where we are. And thankfully uh, the community was very much on board and, and the project evolved uh, so much over the first couple of years. And what we noticed is that we had people from the nearby communities coming to us to access the stuff we had available. And, and it was 2019 when we had um, an opportunity to apply for a national lottery grant, um, who also supported us to start the project in the first place. And that was a pot of money for 50,000 pounds which for us at the time was an incredible amount of money. And we were like, oh, given we have this opportunity, you know, what would be, what could we do with that if we were to get that amount of money? So that's how the idea of going mobile came about. And um, because around us there are, you know, small towns of, three, four thousand people, and some of them uh, have the highest index of poverty in the country. So that's how the idea came about. And the, the way that grant worked was that we applied and we got shortlisted, and then people had to vote for the projects they wanted to, to see uh, becoming a re reality. And we were very lucky to get it. So throughout the yeah the end of 2019 and then as when the pandemic started we were in the process of converting this van and um, as you can see the, the real transformation because our name is Share Sheds we went with this uh, somewhat at the time felt like a crazy idea to have a shed on wheels so it's a real a really beautiful vehicle made of timber a cedar. And yet, uh, as you can see, we were very kind of we were thinking of how can we make this really work, and it took a bit of creativity and also engaging with people, not only carpenters but people who are very good at visualizing. You know, when I got in the van, I was like, oh, I can't really picture how we could fit 
the most popular items at least. By then we already had two and a half years of experience at running a library of things. So we knew what people were most interested in. And the idea was that we would have the most one popular items in the van and we would have a storage space. In our case, we have a, a, a little garage that um, actually one of our members lets us use it free of charge where we keep the most like more bulky items like a wheelbarrow or extendable ladder. So things that people that are not very popular and yet when people want, they can book it. We say in the description of the item, we need a week notice so we can go to this garage, put in and add it to the van. Uh, we do have a, a solar panel and that's so we, in an inverter, so we have a bit of power in the van. So not massive and yet enough to test out, you know, um, a streamer or just something electrical, just to make sure it's working and to charge up our iPad. So we have a couple of iPads and, and a mobile phone that we use for the share shed. So that was felt really important. Um, as you can see, the, the storage, you know, it's very like versatile and unique. So in order to accommodate, so we have a combination of shelves and and hooks. And um, at the bottom, you can see that we use an inner tube for from bicycles to kind of tight up things that like carpet cleaners, so they don't fall when the van is in movement. And so everything has to be hinged. Um, we currently and this we started with three communities. And uh, based on the, the practicality, meaning what was doable for us in terms of distance, but also the, the needs. So Buckfast Lee is one of the, as I mentioned, it's one of the towns with highest index of poverty. So we really wanted to target that community as well as others. You know, this is all countryside towns. And so it was a combination between needs and interest, meaning the, the local authorities were reach out to us like, look, it's a really great project. We would love if you could serve our town too. Next slide, please. And uh, yeah, the project over the years uh, has evolved and we currently have about 350 items. And throughout, yeah, so since April, 2017, we've had 2,700 people becoming members and that has led to over 5,000 loans. Uh, and we estimated that we've helped people save uh, over 400,000 pounds, which is lovely. We we are a combination of two part-time staff members and we rely on the kindness of our volunteers in order to um, run the service because ideally we want to have a staff member when the event is open, as long with the volunteers in terms of health and safety, having two people there. And we are very also lucky for it because we have uh, various repair cafes in these communities. So we currently uh, serve seven um, communities and three of them have established repair cafes. So they we liaise a lot with them in terms of maintaining our items and just out of curiosity these are the 10 most popular items in our case um here in england next slide please um in terms of challenges and opportunities uh, i wanted to share that unfortunately we did have this very unfortunate occasion that, that uh, our van got broken to and that was a, a real learning experience as far as uh, the, it was the first time we ever left the van and uh, not the, where it usually stays overnight, which is a car that has lockable gates and CCTV cameras. It was literally a one-off occasion where uh, the main staff member who drives the van uh, was my colleague Mark. Uh, just because of the logistics, wouldn't be able to do the van, get the van from where it is in the following day. So we left where the, in a public space where we we were meant to be open the following day. And as he got there in the, in the morning, the van had been broken into. Sadly, a few things had been stolen. And, and the reason I'm sharing that is one was a hard learning 
you know, in terms of, no, we have to leave it where it's locked and it has a CCTV camera. Um, and at the same time, the flip side was that this is the most popular um, social media posts and we, out of that, got a lot of publicity and the local newspapers were contacting us to and sharing our story. And out of that, um, a lot of, it, I find it very moving. A lot of people started donating money to us because they were just touched by what we were up to. And, and you know, and yeah, unexpectedly, we then gained a lot of attention. So it's just like one of those, uh, I suppose, unexpected things uh, that we went through. And um, just wanted to share also that as, as well as volunteers, we have a team of people, like of drivers, because I actually don't drive the van. I'm the person who is doing the everyday admin and fundraising and comms. And is an inconvenience that I can't drive the van. So my, as I said, my main colleague, Mark, is there day in, day out. And now we have a team of three other backup drivers. So either when he's on annual leave or obviously sometimes things come up. So it's it's become much more um, resilient to the project by having those extra people on board. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, in terms of our journey, um, another challenge has been funding. So we still very much rely on grants uh, in order to offer services in, in terms of the you know affordability and trying to make it convenient. Uh, so it's been a real challenge between our expansion because we've been giving grants to go to other towns and we still get a lot of requests. But every time we go to a new town, it means that we lose a lot of money in the at least first two years because it takes time to build markets. You know, it takes time for people to know about it and then to really shift how they they consume, I suppose, and leave. Um, so that's been an ongoing challenge. And at the very moment, we're crowdfunding um, because while we've been very lucky over the past seven years with grants, we it's been a real challenge certainly i imagine it's all over the world and also in the uk in terms of the competition and the availability for funds so we're you know trying at the moment to raise thirty thousand pounds uh so if you do have if you're able to spare any cash and we and i re re really mean any contribution we are very thankful because at the moment we've got a much funder um and you can find more information in that link on our website um yeah uh, at the same time it's the most rewarding job and it's it's really transformational to see how many people are you know changing how they live how they consume so and it's really lovely with this mobile experience to be able to go to the communities where they wouldn't have access to such services or resources. So that's been our journey in terms of running a library of things in rural Devon. Thank you very much. I, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, do, do let me know. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Marilyn. Yeah, please do add questions in the chat. I've got a few questions just to get us started. Um, sure. And actually, I will go with this one. Um, uh, Francesca asks, what is the cost of running the van monthly? So what is kind of the operating costs? Yeah, good question. We, the, the fuel, for instance, is about 180 pounds a month. We we just had literally today the van MOTs, uh, which in the UK needs to do that every year. And, and you know, that's the thing, it is a great unknown as far as like every time it goes in the garage, we're like, oh gosh, fingers crossed. So this time around, it was 1400 uh, pounds. So, and, and then it has service. So I don't know how exactly that would work monthly, but mm -hmm. because it's all variable depending on what's up with the van. 
uh, it was a second-hand van, so there's always that you know risk involved. We, for instance, when we bought it, we didn't realize the whole body of it was rotten. So that's why we had to take the whole body out and just keep this chassis, even though we had hired someone who was meant to be an expert to assess that. So, you know, it's really tricky uh, mm -hmm. to put a figure uh, in that. However, you know, that's the, 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 in terms of the contrast of having a, a place we don't pay rent, we don't have, you know, electricity and all those bills ongoingly. So mm -hmm. there's that trade, I suppose. Got it. And I'm wondering if you can just kind of touch on three things maybe at once, um, you know, related to your locations that you're at. Mm -hmm. um, so a man has got a, a question here asking about kind of where do you park for those open times? Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering, um, you know, you, you mentioned that, that, you know, in between at night, you normally have a, a storage, you know, lock storage place. You're able to have the vehicle. Um, so you don't have break-ins except for that one time. Uh, yeah. But wondering kind of, yeah. So where have you, how have you chosen the physical locations that you're at? Um, and, you know, are they connected with any other organizations or businesses or things like that, that you kind of partner with? Um, and how, you know, is it that you're going to each one of these, these locations once per week? Um, and if so, like how long do you spend, you know, at each one of those locations? Like how, how many hours are you open at those locations? Sure. So, um, yeah, I should have made that clear that we go to these seven locations once a week. So our loans work on a weekly basis. And we started out in Totnes, and Totnes is where also coincidentally the transition town movement began. And the reason why I mentioned that is because it's a very, it's, it's a community known uh, for being very progressive. Therefore, the buying was very, like, not straightforward, but certainly much easier than elsewhere. And because we've been here the longest, and we are part, the, the Share Shed is part of an umbrella organization network of well-being, we're very well connected in this community already. Therefore, this is where the most trade happens, like by far. And mm. in terms of choosing the locations, um, it was, as I mentioned, a combination between the needs uh, in terms of identifying you know, the poorest communities around us, the logistic routes, so what makes sense. Uh, so we do uh, up to two locations a day. And so it's like two or three hours in the morning, one, and then two or three hours, then move, then two or three hours. Now, you know, we are we're still tweaking things as we go along because it's a whole, there's time to set it up, close down if it's raining, you know, we don't, we, when it's, it's not raining, we want to display things outside, but if it's raining, all these things are crumbed, it makes the physical space a bit more limited. Uh, and then there's the interest from the local councils. So in the UK, thankfully, there has been a movement in terms of local authorities declaring climate emergence, and in order to support mm -hmm. their agenda and meeting their carbon emissions targets, they've kind of reached out to us and what has happened is that some of them supported us with grants to begin with, to try out, to build demands. The long-term vision, we would love for all these communities to have their own library of things. We want to make ourselves redundant, meaning we want to continue going elsewhere and they have their own projects. We're experimenting at the moment in terms of having a locker because you know it's such a short window, two or three hours. Obviously, a lot of people cannot make that time window. So we're, we experiment with drop off and pick up place. People can, so we have that flexibility. And yeah, it, it's a real like evolving, evolving depending on, you asked about partnerships, Tom, mm -hmm. and depend, you know, it's, we, location is key. I think by now, after the sessions, you would all know that how being where people already are is important. So we've been trying to be like in one of the locations where we go to a knife bridge, we're just off the main, you know, and these are always small towns where everything happens in the high streets. And as soon as we're not in the high streets, it's much uh, lower 
like many, many sorry but i'm a bit struggling with the english <laughs> which is like less people you know mm -hmm. so and we try to be where people are but sometimes it's not doable because we take up a lot of space we need three parking space to, between opening the van and being open and people don't want to sometimes to offer that um because limited car park so you know living learning and adjusting as we go along yeah and can you just touch on very quickly about the this, the towns you're going to, are these mostly rural areas? Yeah, so se seven communities, about uh, 4,000 people uh, each. And, um, and recent, so that our latest expansion was to two bigger towns, so 13,000 people each. And, um, and, and we thought that when we extended to these towns, and that was in a combination of between people reaching out to us and the local authority asking if we could go there. And they're a bit further. So, we, you know, in terms of cost for us is the time, is the fuel. And, and yet, yet we thought like it's going to be a no brainer because we'll get much more trade there. And it turned out that it's taking us a quite a lot of time to gather momentum. And because we don't, we're not connected, well connected in these communities. So that's been another learning how important it is. You know, what we're trying now is to connect with the connectors in the towns. Who are the people who are on the ground, who know everyone, who is involved with all the projects. So that there is being like there has been a gap between our intentions and our ability to really engage with the community because we're not, you know, naturally you know here where I live, I'm talk with people where Mark lives, it makes a, a lot of difference. So that has been an interesting learning too. Got it, thank you. And there was another question just about, um, you know, whether or not the, the share shed requires any type of special commercial driver's license to be able to drive. And if so, is that certification for volunteers that are driving covered by the organization or is that something that expected of the volunteers to be able to um, get themselves sure so no in our case we went with a van that's up to three and a half tons that it doesn't require a special license so it, we we went that like because it we're in devil in this account where the roads are really uh narrow so that was also something that we had to take into account. You know, it's different if you're in a city and you could have a bus, for instance. It's just in terms of practicality. Um, that was an aspect, but no, it doesn't require special license. And the drivers, because the drivers are also the people who open up and serve the customers and deals with money, they're all uh, paid members. So they're Okay. The volunteers are helping us running alongside it, but whoever is driving because of the level of responsibility it entails, um, we, our model, you know, is that we, these are staff members. Um, even though some they're just like on a uh, occasional ad, ad hoc basis. And um, another aspect is the insurance. So it, it makes a lot of difference. We wanted, um, for insurance to be any, rather than named drivers, to be any drivers over 30 years old, because that really affects the price. So that's mm -hmm. how we worked out. It just happens that our drivers are over 30 anyway, and that makes it much more affordable. But rather than having the four people who currently drive, because sometimes we, none of them are available. We've had occasions when mm -hmm. we had to get someone like who can drive. And, and so that was another aspect to consider. Got it. Thank you. Um, and just final, because we need to wrap up and move on to our next uh, presenter. But I wanted to ask you, like, you know, one, you talked about the, you know, the issue with, of the of the share shake getting broken into the one time you didn't put it, uh, you know, into your normal storage. Um, have you had any other problems like with items not being returned, you know, the fact that you don't have a physical location or that you're not as an established organization within a community? Is there any issues with respect for the items themselves? Um, any of those kind of problems that you've had to face? 
I'm very pleased to report that what the biggest learning throughout it has been the amount of abundance and generosity. So when we started out, there was a lot of mistrust, and that was something very interesting to navigate and a lot of fear. And the, the beauty of learning a lot of things, certainly, and, and I also appreciate that it's being lucky, because unfortunately, I have heard some wild stories, very unfortunate stories. But in our case, in seven years, we've had about five items that have gone missing. And four of them, we have a pretty good idea of what happened. And it was like, you know, someone was moving houses, the other went to the hospital. It's like, and it's just one, literally one occasion, which we still don't know what happened. It was an angle grinder who, it was the first and only time we felt the person wasn't genuine. And, and yet is is a theory we don't know we'll never know and this person lived in so far away that we didn't feel it was worth enough to go and make the effort you know we tried to reach out to them via email and telephone but it didn't work out so that was thankfully the only time we've we 95 percent of our things are second hand so we operate with things that are donated to us so obviously there's a natural way and tear of things like today, someone contacted us that the pressure washer is not working. And so it's very disappointing when that happens. And we try to keep things very much in the best working condition, but it does happen, you know, and and literally uh, like 100% of times people are very understanding. And obviously we try to do our best, you know, to offer a replacement. Sometimes we go and take a replacement to them ourselves. But um, this has really kind of boost my sense of hope and care for people and trust in the universe because people are generally very, you know, full of good intentions and goodwill and up to good stuff. So that has been the most rewarding yeah. learning of it all. Excellent. And just final question from Teddy. Um, is, you know, what if someone can't return an item when the share set is back in their community? Are they charged a late fee or, or how do you work that out? So we usually, um, they can be extended online. We use Lend Engine as our software and they can, you know, even to return to another town, which is also great because sometimes that works for people. And yeah, we do, you know, if they are going to have it for one more week, we charge for an extra week. Um, at the same time, you know, it, it does happen like it, it happened last week. Someone had to have a trip unexpectedly, couldn't return the knife, and they, and they did re like reach out to say, but we're like, oh, it's reserved for somebody else. And so then they eventually got a friend to come and return it. But it was just because it had been reserved, otherwise, you know, we would say no problem, we will have it for one more week. Um, but another aspect of our project, and, you know, I'm proud to share that we made very sure that we didn't want money to be a barrier for people to use our services. So we state that on our website, and while we obviously rely on the income we generate, we also have at our core at the core of our mission that people, especially those who need the most and cannot afford things, still reach out to us, look, and we say, look, just make a donation, whatever works. You know, someone wanted to grow a lawnmower, just like it's nine quid, nine pounds for a week. And they said, unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's I'm not able to do that. And we're like, okay, what what can you do? You're like, oh, I've got two pounds here, like great. To, and they were so, you know, so appreciative. And that's also lovely to be able to be at, at service in, in that yeah. level. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Morella, for sharing that. And in a moment, I'm going to go ahead and um, we've got a case study about the launching of the Share Shed on Shareable. And I'll drop that link in here as well. Yeah. Um, feel free to that, reach out yeah. if you have any questions, if there are any things that are not very clear. I'll, I'll leave the my email on, in the chat box. Great, thanks, Morella. Appreciate it. Um, I think we're ready to pass it off to Anna. Hi, everyone. One second. 
All right. So my name is Anna. And can you guys see it? Everyone able to see? No, we're okay. seeing those those bars across your screen. There, there we go. Yeah. You can see the the presentation yeah, now. It's now? yeah, now it's yeah. If you want to go ahead and go to slideshow mode again, yeah, great. Working. Yes. Okay. So my name is Anna, um, and I am the CEO and and founder of the Circular Library Network. We started in 2018 as Munasapo Reykjavikur or Reykjavik Tool Library. And we started out of the fact that I needed a drill and I don't know anyone in Iceland. I'm originally from Brazil and I moved here in 2017. And I realized that people were throwing electronics by the buckets here. And I went dumpster diving and I found a bunch of usable drills. Um, so I decided I went to open a tool library. I didn't know much about it, so I contacted Lawrence from the library of uh, the uh, the tool library in Toronto. Uh, he's the founder there, or original founder there, and I told him that I was gonna come and crash on his sofa uh, to learn about it. Uh, so I did that, um, and while I was there, it turns out I was very sick. I have an autoimmune disease, so when I returned to Iceland, I went straight into hospital, and uh, from hospital, I started a crowdfunding campaign. And I made a really shitty website. And by the time I left, uh, I actually had the money for um, starting a tool library. So I saw a tool library and a repair cafe, which is called Redinger Cafe um, at the same time. But very quickly I realized I couldn't afford to keep running a tool library. In Iceland, uh, if there's an opening hour that's considered a job, so it's illegal to volunteer. So right from the get go, we had to have employees. I managed to get some grants uh, from the city of Reykjavik uh, to be able to, you know, allow people to uh, allow us to have a location and uh, be able to have some staff. But it we moved in the first two and a half years of the tool library, we moved five times because uh, rent here is so, so expensive. And it was just very difficult to be able to maintain their opening hours because it became that we had two days open and then we had four days open and then we had seven days open because the demand was so high and we couldn't really cope with it. So I spoke to Jean uh, during around 2020, COVID hit and we were all stuck at home and there was never more than a bigger demand for the two library here. Uh, but I couldn't do anything with the lending, so it was very difficult uh, because we were operating the same premises as Reykjavik Library, so we were closing when they are closed uh, for COVID. And I called Jean from my turn and I said, hey, Jean, um, can I automate this? And he was like, what are you on about? I said, I spoke to the guys from the Library of Things in London. I asked them if we could use their system. They said no at the time because they were still developing it, and then it turns out it was super expensive. So I asked him if he would be willing to allow me to use my turn and the API to build a self-checkout system that was fully automated in part uh, and paired with my turn. Gene very kindly said yes, and now he's an investor in CLN. <laughs> um, and we decided to then split. So the Munasap uh, is split into two. So Circle Library Network is now an infrastructure provider for sharing economy. And the NGO called Ringras of Set to Iceland, or the Circular Economy Center of Iceland, which is now responsible for the tool library here, uh, the management of the tool library and the repair cafe events. Um, we prototyped this um, quite a lot. My living room is currently our makerspace. Um, and we made this so it's completely modular. So all the shelves can be changed, all the drawer, um, doors can be changed, uh, the lockers can be moved around, and the system, the interactive system is white label. So every single tool library around the world can put their own branding. And we did this because we wanted something that was personalized to our local community. We really wanted to be able to cater for the people here in Iceland in a way that was, you know, relatable to them in their language, in their design, and so on. And when we start building this, the same way that I spoke to the Library of Things in London, a lot of people started reaching out to me because we were posting this on our social media and people were curious about it. 
So we decided to, if we're going to do this, we're going to do this proper. And we got quite a bit of grant. So we have raised like 360,000 euros so far in R&D money uh, from the government in Iceland, which is very much pro circular economy. And what we developed is something that can be installed from IKEA furniture to your own design cabinets, to already existing cabinets, to our design cabinets. Um, and we did that so we can, you know, spread the project fast. Um, because I, I believe there's a lot of people that have the same issues. Iceland's a very small country. We have 340,000 people living here and we have smaller communities and they need access every now and then, not all the time. So instead of doing something like the share sheds did uh, with a car, uh, mostly because I don't drive, <laughs> but uh, we kind of decided that we we're just going to put stations uh, everywhere. So we currently have five locations here in Iceland and um, three more opening this year. And then it kind of went a little cuckoo. Uh, we had lots and lots of people reaching out to us uh, because they wanted to do the same. So because we were very early stage, uh, on the development of the pilots. We selected a few people to work with us uh, while we're pilot piloting this with the intention of, of being very honest, like we're still on the build-up phase. You're going to encounter lots of bugs if you install this yourself. Um, you're going to have to do some of the work on your own and you have to build it on your own. And we were lucky uh, that Chris from Think Great and we have uh, Najin from Boschen in Germany and uh, Sebastian and some other guys from uh, the Manivelle in Geneva, as well as Johnny from Montana Hackerspace. They all have the correct, at the time, the correct skill sets that we needed to be able to start piloting this abroad. And I'm happy to share that Germany now in Bushen, they have three systems. In Geneva, they have two and they're opening two more this year. Um, in Vancouver, uh, Chris has one. We have five and then in Montana, John is still building his right now because he's a little bit of a crazy person. He wants to make a hole in the side of the building that he wants to put the system up. Anyway, <laughs> um, and so what we decided is that now we are like, a, we have the NGO that runs the projects here in Iceland. And then we have this, this company where we provide the infrastructure and we, everything that is highlighted in, 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 uh, bold is things that we develop ourselves so we created our own social media as well so everyone that is partner of the cln uh, can have a place for us to have peer-to-peer -peer support and talk to each other and learn best practices and learn what works when you're building what doesn't work what where are the bugs who can fix it and to really try and reward it as a company uh, together so we are implementing next year a rewarding system where basically it's like going to be a little bit like Reddit, where people give really good advice and everyone votes that that's a good advice. Their institution gets a share of the CLN. So once we have, uh, you know, profits or exit, whatever, everyone gets a cut. So that way we really want the community to be engaged. And right now with the hardware, it's pretty cool. We managed to make it so simple that like it's all like Lego for, for adults. All the electronics are just click on. And we still have some R&D to do. So we're waiting now to hear back from all the grants that we're working with uh, for specifically for R&D. Um, and the software, we use MyTen, but we are also implementing some of our own sections. We now uh, have an app that is about to launch soon, hopefully, and then people will be able to download and, and take a look at it um, to be able to use the MyTen interface for boring uh, through this app so you can go around. So the plan is to really make this into a network. So let's say you have a membership in Reykjavik with the tool library here. You can go to Germany and Bushon and you find one of those systems and then you can log in into their system and be able to borrow from there by just paying their local fee. So we really want to connect everyone together so we can spread sharing in an eff effective way. Um, all the items we have in Reykjavik are donated uh, or I dumpster dive them and repaired. Um, my background is in conservation, restoration, or historical objects, <laughs> but uh, I prefer to repair toasters. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, and I also have a background in life cycle assessment. So we're working really hard on creating a database of emission savings uh, versus emissions produced. Um, and that's a project under the NGO as well.
I fund students every year. I find funding for students every year to do life cycle assessments of Icelandic raw materials, which is uh, kind of hard. And I think this is uh, my little hero video. I hope it's not too loud, uh, but I just want to show you guys what it looks like when someone uses it. Uh, how I go to the next. There you go. And here's the, the kicker. The reason it's so complicated to build this is uh, all the procedures and everything you have to create for people. So for our um, standard system that we created, uh, we made an IKEA style assembly guide. It took us a year and a half to do it. Honestly, I have a whole new level of respect for IKEA uh, because it is really hard to make an assembly guide that people understand and know how to use it. So you can see our two libraries in the back room there. Uh, we still have a one main tool library. We now only opening during the summer because it is too expensive for us to run uh, year round. But we have the self checkouts in the libraries around Reykjavik and in the swimming pools, which are very popular here, uh, opening this year. And those are the ones that support the community year round. And yeah, that's about it. And I'll stop sharing. That was excellent. I'm definitely excited to learn more about this project as I can see others are in the chat as well. And uh, please do everyone add some questions in the chat. I've got a number of questions to get us started. Um, so one, I wanna just, I'm wondering, uh, you know, how much does it cost to build one of these kiosks? So this is the really cool thing, right? So if you're using an Ikea system, uh, it costs you the 1,000 euro flat fleet that is the electronic kit from us. And okay. we don't make any money on the electronic kit. Uh, we literally just want people to do it. Where we are making our income right now as a company is that we share the funds 50-50 with MyTurn. MyTurn, for those who don't know, is an amazing software. Gene is a fucking genius. Sorry, apologies for the bad language, but I can't help it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he, he's done a fantastic job. If you don't know Gene, he's one of the original Seattle Tool Libraries founders 20 years ago, you know, so this guy really knows what he's doing. And um, is a joy working with him because we can create and develop this stuff. I just want people to share more. A little bit frustrated with the, you know, Tulu and I hope that these communities are coming up and trying to do something that I'm passionate about. I don't really care for the money. That's never been a thing for me, but I want to make this simple so you can make the system. If you do it yourself, you buy the plywood on your own. If you have access to a fab lab, you can make it as cheap as 2000 euros, especially now that we're launching the app, you're not gonna need a touch screen interface. That's gonna be even cheaper because right now the touch screen is one of the most expensive parts of the system, but you can use a tablet in in uh, Tinkery in, in Vancouver. Chris just used a tablet he, he owned and a Pi system to run the whole system, which is totally doable because that's the whole point of it is to be scalable. Um, and we are, I think what we really found out is that um, people don't have the skills. So this is very interesting. When it comes to building, just because you work in a tool library, that doesn't mean that you have lots of building skills. So um, what we want is to make something that is simple for those who don't. So that's why we are focusing on IKEA furniture. Also on a point on that, the Kallax system from IKEA is one of the most thrown away pieces of furniture in the world. So if we can upcycle that, two in one, right? So uh, yeah, that's, uh, so it can be as cheap as, 1,000 euros if you already have the Kallax and as expensive as 
20,000 euros as it was our first ever prototype, which I built it myself. <laughs> and no. uh, it, it was uh, not great. <laughs> uh, so another question coming in uh, from, from Dagen um, to begin with is, uh, how do you determine what tools or items are needed at any individual location? Um, okay. You know, is it fixed or are there different materials uh, made available over time? So we have fixed items that we change every six months, but we put out a vote to the members. So if you live near one of the locations, your postcode is the same as one of the locations, you get to vote in what you want available on that location. And then we do a pop-up um, with the tool library every summer for things like lawnmowers and things like that. You know, this is Iceland, it, you know, it's not sunny and able to, to mow grass all year round here. Uh, so, you know, we do have like, for example, an ice cream machine, extremely popular. <laughs> Icelanders love ice cream, go figure. Uh, and then uh, projectors are super popular. Carpet cleaners are super popular. So we have those in each location. And then we change other items. Um, like for example, in the winter we have a snow shovel and then in the summer we have camping gear. We just swap things around. Uh, we do the best we can with, um, you know, the six months period, we do every six months. We wanted to do every three months, but because right now, I'll be very honest, I'm doing so much. I am running the NGO and then running the tool library and running repair cafes and running a, a startup now, which now I'm a tech company. I didn't sign up for it, but that's where we are now. So uh, hopefully in the next couple of years, I can establish something more sustainable where other people will be managing the system. Iceland has a really good program about hiring unemployed people, so we can actually get some funding to hire people that are unemployed. And this might be a good work for people with disabilities as well, so we might be able to find funding to get people uh, employed in those areas. But uh, Iceland is illegal to volunteer for opening hours, and that was one of the biggest pushes that we had to move this forward. Got it. Yeah. Um Wondering how does the API connect if you're already using my turn for your existing library? So do yeah. the kiosk locations function like another branch location? Yeah, yeah, it does. So basically you can have one my turn that manages multiple locations. And how do the um how are so are people getting memberships for the central uh, library of things, and then that extends to all those, or are there specific memberships for like a local kiosk? We have three types of memberships. We have a membership for the tool library that allows you to borrow from everywhere. A membership is specifically for kiosks if you have a library card, because most of our kiosks are library cards, so we do a cheaper uh, discount. And then a membership if you don't have a library card. But basically, since we start working with the libraries, we increase their food traffic by 15% and membership numbers. So it's super impactful to be able to collaborate with them. When I first started this, they were very skeptical and now everyone wants one. So it's quite funny. Yeah. And we're gonna just, as a side note, we're gonna be having a session in two weeks uh, focused on how to work with and within public libraries. So we'll be diving more into this and this seems like a really great way to do that. Um, I'm also wondering, well, one, you just talked about different membership levels. Um, are Do you charge for a general uh, monthly or annual membership or for per use or kind of how does that work? So right now we personally charge membership, so per year, but uh, my tenant allows you to do whatever you want. So you can do rental, you can do borrow, you can do free. Mm -hmm. That like right. we really want to make, so it's easy for people to do this on their own. Yeah. Yeah. Like that is the point. Like I didn't start a tech company, <laughs> which is that really funny right now because we're trying to fundraise because of the biggest issue I have right now is that whenever someone buys a system from us, electronic, it takes us two months to deliver to them because it arrives here, we build it and then we send it to them. So right now I'm trying to raise a small round to, to fund a bunch of those systems, get them all packaged and ready to the ship out. And then we can turn that around. But the startup scene, I don't know if anyone has seen, is it, so difficult. It's uh, we we are not considered desirable because we are people and planet first. You know, we are not thinking of uh, becoming rich. 
uh, <laughs> of the back mm -hmm. of other people doing the job, which is, uh, you know, uh, a problem for a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but I don't care. So me, Gene is being super kind and he's has been helping us. And, you know, we have managed to raise the grants and, and keep ourselves afloat that way. But I do think that eventually we'll be able to support ourselves through uh, the the subscription and, and so on. Um, it's just a matter of volume. I just want everyone to join in. And yeah. Excellent. So we've, we've got another presentation coming up in just a moment. Um, I do want to ask just a couple of quick questions um, and maybe you can kind of get on those very quickly. You know, one concern that I've always had or question about these kiosk systems is around maintenance of items. I think that's one of the things that's really important. Oftentimes what we've seen with, you know, physical locations is that they pass through somebody's hand that checks the tool, make sure it's operational before they check it out to reduce that type of, you know, issue of, of that, you know, how, how are you doing that with these kiosks? Okay, I'm very proud of this. We created an automated uh, maintenance system. So when someone returns the item, if it needs maintenance, they just click a button and then the item is taken out of commission. We receive an mm -hmm. email telling us that the item needs repaired. They receive an email asking them what happened to it. And we got 70% more response on repaired items since we did that because people are ashamed to tell them that to tell us that it's broken when they return so we actually lowered it by making it this way so they don't have to face anyone they don't have to tell anyone that there's a problem it made it much easier for them to tell us that there's a problem so we have a much higher repair rate we do a weekly tour we go around and we check all items once a week um, mm -hmm. and that generally is where we're at all right that was very interesting to find out. Um, next one is, how are you doing the carbon tracking? Okay, so right now, Maiten has worked with the um, Edinburgh Tool Library, and they created mm -hmm. a carbon emission calculator. But as someone who has background in LCAs, that is not correct. Right now, that's kind of greenwashing, so I don't really do roll with that. What we have to account for is uh, an item being borrowed uh, the first time. That is the emission they accept. You won't save, save the emission the first time an item is borrowed by one person, right? Yeah. So if the yep. same person borrowed the same item multiple times, you won't save emissions once. So that has to be created as a formula and a framework. And that's a bit harder to do than people think. So we are currently working on that because not only that, you also need to have an accurate database for it. So we're doing an average database and then aiming to then have an accurate database but, you know, manufacturers are a pain in the ass. They don't want to share the data. They don't want it to tell you. They love to buy your data off you if you were to offer. They were, like, we don't partner up with uh, companies uh, to put items in the system because we, have a, we are pro secondhand. So we don't really do new items. But the other thing is that a lot of the people that are currently doing this, they're selling data back. And when they sell data back, you're kind of trying to make yourself like broke, like, like, like you're gonna close down because if you're selling the data back to the two people, they know what to do. They're not gonna need you anymore. So mm -hmm. it's like it, it making us irrelevant. And the whole point of this is community, right? By automating the self systems, I have more time for repair cafes and more time for events and workshops. I don't now because I'm now running a, a startup apparently, but uh, that was the intention originally with building this. Um, like I love the contact with people and repairing and talking to people, but I don't need to be the one boring them a drill every other week. You know, that can be automated. We can have the contact with people on a different level on a more, uh, you know, let's go and, and fix some jumpers together sort of thing that that's more for me. Got it. Um, and so we just final question, and then we're, we're going to stick go a little long today because we've got one more presentation. This has been so rich. It's hard to stop. Um, <laughs> when do you anticipate the app being ready? Oh, I am literally waiting for be to be told if it's being approved or not on this store. So All right. <laughs> it should be ready, hopefully, next week. I am pro to So there is an Icelandic Innovation Week, which is a startup thing. I made a bunch of battery banks out of all the scooter batteries that we collected from the battery, the company, the scooter company here. And we made like charge, rechargeable battery banks out of them. 
And I'm going to lend them out throughout this conference. And we're going to test the IKEA furniture with drawers through the app. So that's the, the plan right now is to test how that works. That working, then we are going to Roskilde Music Festival in Denmark next month, uh, where uh, we are going to let people assemble the IKEA furniture and we're just going to let them do it. And we're going to see what they do and then base the assembly guide on what they do. Because honestly, assembly guides are pain ass. I, IKEA, take the hat. Honestly, it is. it was the worst year of my life <laughs> writing this up. But basically, we want people to assemble it and then we'll base. And so the plan is to have all this ready to roll uh, after the summer. So IKEA huh. system. So like it will be only eight doors maximum. It will be a much simpler version of the electronics. It won't be as modular as what we have right now, but it's still modular uh, and mm -hmm. much more cost effective for those who don't have the big budget for it. All right. Well, thank you for that. And just, you know, IKEA Foundation they do, they fund a lot of circular economy projects. It seems okay. like I, I know, I know, I know. They are I know. Well, that's Tulu, another story, which I have opinions about. So yeah. until yeah. they are working with Tulu, like so, <laughs> one of our angel investors is Daniel Houtier, who is the head of circular economy in IKEA. So okay. he, they know about us, but they're not. You're not allowed to hacking furniture IKEA. They they're against it. So really, I'm just fighting the system now. <laughs> <laughs> And would you be willing to just uh, add your contact information in the chat for anybody that's yeah. participating that wants to get in touch with you? Yeah, um, we are currently uh, organizing the next cohort of people that we're onboarding for the system. If you're interested or if you want to know, uh, we're only going to sell 55 this year. And that is not 55 people, it's 55 locations total. So we are allowing people that have the capability of buying multiples to be in the list as well because then we can really test things. Um, I'm going to put the website. So if you want to sign up for the cohort, please do. Um, and then we are going to be in contact with people after the summer to start selling it. Excellent. If I Thanks close so much. this round, who yep. knows? Yep. Who knows? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's like, right now it's very crazy. And so we also part of this European union funding thing and they want to give us two million years in the end of the year and then if that happens because we don't know but if that happens then i'm paying for everyone in europe to have their own and then they can pay us back when they have the money <laughs> excellent love that so much all right so we know some people have to jump off at the top of the hour um the next session will be recorded love it if you all could stay stick around for another 15 minutes and uh you know we've talked about uh mobile in a truck uh, then we now just talking about mobile through kiosks and being able to have distributed libraries of things uh, throughout communities. And next, we're going to be focusing on building uh, libraries of things in non-permanent structures, such as a shipping container. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Amanda. I go to share and everything moves. Sorry about that. Well, this is going to seem extremely boring compared to the exciting <laughs> session from Anne, but <laughs> can you guys, it's still loading here. Yeah, I'm wondering if we should, if I should just oh. go, oh, here we are. We're there here. we go. Okay, all right. Sorry, if you guys are sick of hearing from me, but um, I'm Amanda Miller. I'm the executive director of the South King Tool Libraries and I am, very happy to talk to you guys today about shipping containers. Um, aside from running these organizations, I actually uh, spent a decade in supply chain logistics and running warehousing uh, distribution for um, <laughs> uh, for uh, Honda motorcycles and power equipment. So I got to see uh, some of the dirty world of manufacturing um, and supply chain. So um, yeah, real quick, you know, an argument for this, I was getting visions of what if we put these modular structures into shipping containers uh, and then we could put them anywhere we wanted to. So anyway, there, that's another side quest, but there are about 67 million of these shipping containers throughout the, the planet. So there's a lot of these, there's a great argument to use shipping containers. And when <clears throat> Tom reached out to me about talking about shipping containers, um, my stomach starts to like get tight and I start to have 
nightmares and sweat uh, because this is a pretty difficult time in my life uh, to figure out how to build a building out of something that doesn't want to be anything what it already is. So I went to my civil engineer dad and I sent him the plans uh, and I said, you know, how do I get this built? And he just responds back and he's like, why would you do this? <laughs> uh, this is a perfectly designed thing to be what it's supposed to be. Don't cut into it. Don't do these other things. And, you know, he didn't quite get it. And there's a million reasons as to why we landed on this project. But um, we ended up building our first building out of recycled shipping containers. And um, I did several deep dives on YouTube and all that good stuff for trying to get inspired, trying to figure out what to make heads and tails of these really, you know, immaculate plans that looked uh, look so beautiful, but I couldn't figure out how the Lego bricks came together. This is not Ikea assembly. This is not Lego. This is really um, uh, embodied some of the redundancies in building um, and structure and the lack of planning that we have in foresight. So I'm trying to go to the next slide. Okay, here we go. So initially way back in 2013, um, uh, lovely woman, Patty Southard, uh, came to my friend Jeanette and said, you know, you want to build a tool library. Here's this uh, case study that I did for cargo campers and shared that. And it was a great inspiration to how we ended up where we were. Um, and then we got amazing plans donated by structural engineers and architects that were, um, you know, skilled in actually green development and uh there was a lot of effort made to be really conscientious about materials and the footprint and the impact of the structure. So, uh, and it, being in the Pacific Northwest, it's extremely expensive to be um, anywhere that is not, uh, you know, in the middle of nowhere or maybe floating in the water, but um, square footage ranges from like 20 to $45 per square foot. Uh, and it was not equitable or, or sustainable for us to think about having a space uh, like this that ended up being about 1500 square feet. So uh, the building plans came to us and we thought we were halfway there. Um, that was just the beginning of the concept. Um, just as again, background shipping containers do come in more than a dozen different structures. You have 20, 30, 40, 48 uh, dry vans, you have rail things, you have um, reefer trucks, there's billions of different little things that can be individual about shipping containers, not to mention some of the dangerous elements where you have toxic chemicals, you know, integrated into the paintings and coatings, marine grade is different than uh, maybe rail grade. Um, and then the, the things that they're designed to do is to transport goods. Now, I talk to folks about this all the time with pallets. Um, we all have seen pallet art and upcycling of these things. And I am all for upcycling. I am here, right? Uh, but there are extremely dangerous ways that hazardous chemicals can be penetrated into these vessels. So if someone says, I have a shipping container for you, don't say yes immediately. Um, there's a lot of questions that you gotta get you know, in your belt before you just jump into that endeavor. So, um, you know, 1500 square feet, uh, for a tool library seems like plenty. It seemed like, we, how would we ever even fill this space? But um, we did very quickly. And uh, yeah, there was a lot of <laughs> WTF moments in the time as well. Uh, when we were talking about all the plans that were donated to us and very simple, um, not to mention how it grated my nerves that these fonts were so playful and yet this was so not playful <laughs> to have to deal with uh, the structure and the implementation for connecting things like wood to metal um, and the lack of real design elements that would be sort of basic you know I don't know how do you attach a door there was just magic doors mounted there um, you know this is not uh, something that we don't go to school for. People go to school to figure out how to read these plans. So um, it was a big challenge for community organization to dismantle and uh, approach this question. You can see my drawing at the bottom. <laughs> That's, I did a lot of those trying to 
make it uh, make it math in my head about how and what we were doing and, and where we were going to go with things. So, um, you know, I, I haven't said a lot of positive things yet, but there have been a lot of really great experiences. Um, as Anna just mentioned, just because you run a tool library does not mean that you know how to build things. I often am at this tool library and say, well, I figured out how to do this. I'm pretty sure that you can figure out how to put together an Ikea Calyx because it should be approachable. Um, there's you know, not a simple way to go about this. I'm happy to share all of these plans with you guys, but um, there's a lot of permitting that goes into play with this as well. Uh, there's certain certifications for things like overhead welding when it comes to uh, cutting into the shipping containers that does um, remove some of their structural integrity and how they have to be handled and how you have to reinforce those things, attaching things like a roof to a structure um, that is metal um, becomes a challenge uh, because how every hole you put into the, the metal shipping container is a forever a hole. Um, and that doesn't even count the holes that are there that you don't want to be there after they're used. So, um, there's just a huge amount of things we didn't anticipate when we were coming into it. So here are our actual shipping containers. These blue guys donated very generously uh, and at time pre-pandemic, uh, there's actually been a, um, uh, they, they're not going to be giving away any shipping containers probably ever again from this company uh, since the pandemic for, for some reason things have changed, uh, but also, uh, the way that these shipping containers are used, they are terminal as well, just like everything that we seem to do um, in as humans. And uh, they don't last forever. You can see they're pretty abused. Uh, the things underneath them, they're called chassis. So these are actually port containers that were going to Alaska and back of the port of Seattle. Uh, company is Tote Maritime. And they do international shipping, but mostly to um, to Alaska. And um, just that those journeys, I'm sure you all have seen in the news at some point. You know those vessels that have the massive stacks um, of containers going around the world. Um, those are these guys uh, lifted up by cranes, moved onto trucks. Um, it's not something that is readily delivered and dropped onto the ground or onto footings. So. Uh, those are things to take into consideration when you're looking at how a mobile this would be. Um, you know, shipping containers are um, really durable, but the there are just a couple ways between cranes, uh, forklifts that are adaptive, uh, and things like um, tilt trailers that would be able to move these things, or they call those row row sometimes roll on roll off. Uh, so there's some mobility to that, but a lot of the time folks that have shipping containers dropped, they are there for quite a long time. Um, and then moving those things would be, you know, that was always our plan is if we did need to move the tool library, we would be able to do that. We'd have to hire a crane to do that. There's a cost, lots of certifications. You would be hard pressed to find a volunteer that would probably be willing to, um, operate a crane uh, on a uh, no cost level. So um, we did incur quite a lot of costs trying to just safely get these things in place. Again, the inspections and certifications, our building ended up being permitted as an outbuilding or like a shed, uh, which was barely under the, I think I had to have them remove the deck in the front for the square footage maximum for a shed because normally people don't have 1500 square foot sheds put onto their property. Um, and so for us to pass an inspection, um, we needed to meet all of the standards of an outbuilding with the electrical installation being permitted correctly, um, as well as the, um, we got to avoid the RF code, uh, which I can't remember what RF stands for right now, but that would be building in those metal shipping boxes the metal sides and top and bottom, uh, usually about two feet uh, roughly. So you have eight feet by eight feet, eight feet tall by eight feet wide. 
and then usually 40 or uh, 48 feet long. So you would lose a huge amount of space building it up to a RF code, which in would involve framing out quite a lot of the inside. So we decided against it. We wanted to utilize as much space as possible. Um, <clears throat> and for all of the people old enough to remember the, uh, <laughs> uh, you cut a hole in the box, Saturday Night Live, I won't, it's not funny <laughs> if you don't know, but it's, it's silly. It's what's in my head, sorry. Uh, step one, we cut a hole in our boxes and it was, uh, yeah, okay, Allison got it, great. <laughs> uh, there's a level of, uh, you know, why are we doing this? How do we get these guys? I actually ended up working with a college that had WABO certified welders, which is the certification you need to do overhead welding. And that is for commercial residential regardless. Um, again, no instructions on exactly how to attach the metal to metal. You can't just arc weld uh, different types of metal to each other. So we have quarter inch steel to aluminum essentially, uh, as well as the chemicals uh, you can't see on the right hand bottom. There's a little warning sign that says there are toxic chemicals in the paint of this container. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of different dangers. Um, you see the sparks up in the right hand side, a lot of different factors to, to consider. But um, these kids, they're not kids, they're grown men, but they were going back to school for welding and got their WABO certification. And I said, I will write you really great letters of recommendation if you will do this at a discounted rate. And um, lo and behold, they were really great to work with and did a fabulous job. Um, it just kind of wanted to show you some of these pictures because there's, uh, we did a lot of things backwards, but they ended up working out well with putting the electrical uh, electricity in first and then having um, the, the welders come in because you only have access through those main doors, those two big man doors, which again, aren't, aren't simple to open. So um, it was a pretty secure building until we cut the holes in it and then it was not secure. So um, there's a lot of, uh, I think we were broken into three times when we were under construction. <laughs> so they actually stole the tools that we were working to build the tool library with at one point. Um, and then uh, we did have things in a storage unit and that was broken into too. So um, there's, just a level of, I don't know if there's a safe way to do everything that we're doing, but I have never been uh, more, I guess, encouraged than after break-ins and what happened by the community just showing up and supporting us and the outpouring that happened. So I, I we've already been over time, so I really don't want to take too much more time. I wanted to show um, in my warehousing life and experience, if we said that if you saw light, then <laughs> there were bad words involved. I won't say what we said, but if you see light, don't touch it, leave it alone. Um, because a lot of these shipping containers, freight moves, it busts out the sides, forklifts tear holes in the sides and ours were no exception. I couldn't find our specific pictures, but I just wanted to show what the difference was, uh, you know, in the normal to the, uh, to on the right-hand side at the top and then on the left-hand side, uh, when you see light inside. That is a hole. That also means rust. That also means it's going to be a future problem. But you know, there's a level of how you mitigate those and handle that is going to be uh, a big, um, you know, factor in what the fallout would be. Uh, on the bottom, though, I also wanted to show you the floors. So the floors of these are um, hardwood floors that are uh, we've been we painted over them, uh, but then they are also tarred underneath. And so that's again, marine grade uh, for the water. And that makes it pretty difficult to actually remove those floors. So we decided to just make the best of it. And we ran out of paint to paint the floors in the back, uh, but we painted the hardwood and then left the metal sheet that was at the, that's basically the nose of the trailer uh, there. And then <laughs> just things like doors and windows, we really actually had to engineer the design for that because most doors are designed to be mounted onto two by fours and framed wood buildings. And so this uh, specific design had to be, uh, we, we would say jerry-rigged, I guess is the best way to put it. We uh, had to just totally discount the frame and build that out of steel and then had to um, remount everything on the inside to fit what we needed, which it, 
it involved actually flipping the doors upside down and opposite so that they would fit with the right don't ask me why i don't even remember anymore um and then yeah problems you can see on the top right too there's my friend's spectacular sculpture because it's spectacles but anyway um the windows uh we chose two foot by two foot windows and we actually had folks we're still able to break in windows of that size. So we had some ninjas and mad respect to climbing up about 10 feet and fitting in a one foot by two foot opening. Uh, but that meant we had to put some you know, things across that so they weren't accessible. And then things like not being able to drill into the, the wall makes us creative. So this is my office on the right bottom uh, at the tool library. In, in, to, in federal way. So you can see uh, you get creative uh, and come up with pretty good solutions. The same with our um, our chainsaw chains here uh, on the bottom. Uh, you can see they're held up by magnets and, and labeled. And then we use some like over the door hangers for our bow saws or, you know, travel chests are great. Um, we do like have earthquakes here in the Pacific Northwest as well. So uh, we have some storage racks that have been earthquake strapped. Uh, so those pictures actually, if those hooks that you see on the top, um, those are in the top of the containers and the bottoms of the containers and can provide a good contact point for things like earthquake strapping. Um, but as you can see on the bottom, there's still a lot of stuff on shelves that just goes up. And so uh, we have to constantly manage and, and balance those things. There's also a design here on your left-hand side uh, because if we do install things like wood uh, and on our deck, we have a lot more wood, which is a 15 foot deck that connects the two shipping containers. We have adapted uh, some designs to use all of that space and maximize it. So uh, it's a matter of just getting the contact points correct. And then you can attach to the hardwood floors as well. So that becomes a way to stabilize everything at the bottom. Um, and boom, I did it. Okay, two minutes. That was, that was just that. Um, would I use shipping containers again? I would. Putting them together would make a whole lot more sense instead of putting them further apart. I think if I could choose the design or have more participation in the design process, it might make the process more um, achievable because, um, yeah, it would be a little bit easier. And then, um, yeah. Uh oh, I lost my video. Here we go. Oh, no more video for me. <laughs> oh. Anyway, well, yeah, thank you guys. I did put that link there and I can share that in the chat, hopefully. Let's see. Okay, there we are. Um, so yeah, that's just has a lot of information about shipping containers, dimensions, and um, uh, how to build with them. It's some inspirational stuff too. There's tons online. You can spend all day um, looking at designs for shipping containers too. So yeah, that would be my pro tip though. You use shipping containers, put them together. Just put them together because they like that. Any other questions? I was going to say one of the other uh, presenters we we're going to have that um, it was Great to have Amanda jump in and and talk about their process. We had been ha going to have Chris Diplock from the Thingery in Vancouver, which started out as a kind of mobile self checkout uh, kiosk, but within shipping containers, and now is using um, the same system that Anna has. Um, and so, but there's a case study that we just that I just put in the chat. You can learn more about the Thingery that we covered on Shareable. Ooh. Um, yeah, any last questions for Amanda? This has been a definitely a, a haul of a session. I think all three of these could have been their own. Um, and uh, so thank you all for sticking with us to give a little bit more time to to each one. Um, I also want to say, you know, earlier was mentioned, you know, uh, I think actually, Amanda, you put it in the chat when when Anna was talking about the kind of carbon emissions tra tracking, like environmental impact. Um, as we've said before, we're planning on having a series of monthly sessions that are going to follow for the rest of the year, starting in July. Um, and I think that would make a really wonderful session 
So we may be bringing folks back together for that a little bit later in the year, just to talk about how to do this environmental impact tracking. Um, great. Any other last, last things from anybody before we call this one to a close? Well, again, thank you all for joining us for our 10th session. We'll be back here again next week, um, focusing on kind of complementary programming for libraries of things, uh, educational opportunities, workshops, um, additional materials like fab labs, like how we, how libraries of things are integrating that um, into their programming and serving their members with those additional opportunities. Um, thank you everybody for dropping stuff into the chat. Again, as we mentioned, we're this, we're going to be putting the chat into Canvas so you can access all the links that were shared there. And this uh, presentation uh, draft, uh, the, the PowerPoint, if you will, will be also getting posted to Canvas. All right. Well, thank you all so much. And we're not going to stick around because we're going to be moving on with another event that's starting in just a few minutes. Um, but thank you all for sharing your time, for joining us, and looking forward to seeing you all again. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you all. Wait, hold on. I wanted to find.